Hello everyone, here we are, we're gonna do Obadiah, and I know last night I said, you know, I think I know about him. Well, I guess I didn't because no one knows about him. Uh, it, it's one chapter and it's a vision that he had, and that's about it. So after we read this chapter, we're gonna go right into the four chapters of Jonah, and that's a very interesting story with a lot of things to be gleaned from it. So let's look at Obadiah's vision first, and then we'll go to Jonah. Uh, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom, Esau's line. We've heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, rise, let us go against her for battle. See, I'll make you small among the nations. You'll be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? So we know that this is an indication of pride. Okay, and pride, of course, is spoken of quite a bit in the Bible. And if you lift yourself up, you can be sure the Lord is going to bring you down. Matter of fact, I was just watching something on TV. Uh, what was it? It was, a, it was a Food Network Chopped. And they had five chefs on. And all five came out. And each one was introduced with their own voiceover about who they were. And one chef came out very cocky. And while I appreciated the strength of it, I was a little bit surprised. And he finally did get chopped. He was about the third one to get chopped out of the five. And I saw that look of humility. Um, not humiliation, but humility. I mean, he knew who he was, but he didn't make it. And um, he worked for somebody involved with the show, so it was very important for him to do well. And I guess he did well enough, but I thought about that. I thought, you know, there's that look of, of humility because he was brought down for coming on so cocky. So believe me, it's very true. Pride goes before a fall. Okay, so let's remember that. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I'll bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau or Edom, will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Now, that's humiliating. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you won't detect it. So you won't notice that they're setting a trap for you. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom? Those of understanding in the mountains of Esau, your warriors, T-Man, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter because of the violence against your brother Jacob, which is Israel. You'll be covered with shame. You'll be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth, Jacob's wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them, like the enemy against Jerusalem. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, in other words, those trying to escape, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. This is utter betrayal of a brother to a brother. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. Once again, a mention of the day of the Lord, Revelation talk. As you've done, it'll be done to you. I'm telling you, there's going to be a settling of accounts. Your deeds will return upon your own head, just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. So drinking is very destructive. 
But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It'll be holy and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire and Joseph a flame. Esau will be a stubble, will be stubble. And they'll set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev, remember the desert region, will occupy the mountains of Esau, and people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They'll occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. These are Benjamin was part of Judah, if you remember. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliver, deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. So they're going to get crushed. Jerusalem themselves will crush them, and they'll take over the land, and it's all the Lord's. Okay, so I guess they call that a vision because there's only one chapter of 21 verses. Okay, so we can't quite call it a prophecy that he's giving, um, you know, daily or anything like that. So it's his vision of the end. All right, so let's look at Jonah. You know, I was also thinking, it's interesting that there's 12 minor prophets leading us out of the Old Testament, and there were 12 disciples. And I almost wonder if the ones that God picked to be with Jesus Christ, if they somehow reflected some of these, you know, uh, if there was sort of a match in the uh, 12 minor prophets to the 12 disciples, you know, a one-on-one -on -one match. I just wondered. Because I don't believe in coincidence, so I think it's interesting that there's 12 minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. And then there's also, we're going to see 12 disciples of Jesus. All right, Jonah 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, or Yopa, J-O-P-P-A, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, small g, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. Once again, the Lord using the weather to get the attention of man. They cast lots and a lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? Where is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God, large G, of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. We can cause storms in other people's lives by being disobedient, can't we? I know you can think of at least one instance. Instead, the men did their bat best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. So they were trying to do something before they had to throw someone into the sea. Okay, so these were kind-hearted men. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, don't let us die for taking this man's life. So they're assuming when they throw him in, they're murdering him. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three 
nights. Jonah 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I'll look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. Excuse me. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Listen to that. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. That's powerful and how dangerous it is to have an idol that you love. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So when he was in the belly of the whale, he knew where his help came from, and he cried out for it. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, pre proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So that's the Lord giving him that message to tell them, hey, in 40 days, you're gone. The Ninevites believed God. Uh, wow, that's what we need to do. When you know the Lord's talking to you, it's good to believe him. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah 4. Look at how fast this book is. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Now, here's where I want you to pay attention, because this takes some thinking about. I've, I've had to wonder about this myself and had to determine what the wrong attitude is uh, when I do this kind of stuff, okay? I mean, I'm, I think this was a long time ago for me. I think I get it now, but just listen to this. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. So basically, oh, hold on. I knew that you are great, a gracious and compassionate, compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So basically what he's saying is, I didn't have to go do this for you. I already knew this was going to happen. Why did you send me? And I had to go through all of that with the, the whale and all of that. Why? I already know who you are. I know what you do. This is kind of naughty. It's like, no, 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 no. Sit your butt down and let's go through the whole thing, Jonah. Now, Lord, take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live. So he's having a major temper tantrum. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. 
There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. What a temper tantrum. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant. Though you didn't tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left? and also many animals. And that's the end. So he's saying, if you had concern for this plant and you didn't even do anything for it at all, why should I not be concerned of the people over the people of Nineveh that I created, raised up, in other words, God has his way of doing things, and he chose Jonah to go and be his mouthpiece. And Jonah just doesn't have the right to say what God will love, how much God will love it, and how God wants to do it. So there's a lesson in this for us. I think there's a lot of lessons. One is obey the Lord. Just trust the Lord. So often we don't understand what he's doing honestly. I don't understand what he's doing in my life right now. All I know is that he loves me and he's taking care of me one day at a time. I rely on him. And it's not for me to say, Oh, I knew you'd save those people anyway. Why put me through the trouble? You know, we're either servants or we're not. And I don't think Jonah understood servanthood. You know, most of us, if we were talked to that directly by the Lord, we would hop on an opportunity to be of service to the Lord. But this is a good example of someone who has no understanding, can't see past the end of their own nose, and is saying, look, don't bother me. You know, I already know you're compassionate and good. We should never just assume anything with when the Lord is trying to reach people. We would feel horrible if, as he would feel horrible if Nineveh was destroyed. And the Lord, you know, see, the Lord didn't allow him to get away with not going. And then just, and then maybe Nineveh gets destroyed and that's on Jonah. The Lord did not allow that to happen. He had enough love for Jonah to make sure that Jonah did what was asked of him. So they would all work out exactly the way the Lord wanted it to. And obviously Jonah was the exact right person for the job because it caused the whole city, including the king, to repent and they saved themselves. I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. We will pick it up. Uh, I can't remember what's after Jonah. Let's look. Actually, I don't need to go there. I can go to... Um, all right, bear with me here. I'm going to tell you right now what is after Jonah. We're going to go to Micah and Nahum, I, because I believe Nahum is only one or two, cha or two chapters, because Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament at one chapter. So we'll probably, I think Micah is three chapters, Nahum is two, so we'll probably do those two. And then we have Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.